Welcome to the Audiobook Readers Review, a space for writers, audiobook narrators, producers and listeners, of course, to discuss everything audiobooks. Welcome to the very first episode of the Audiobook Readers Review. My name is Sarah Bakula and I am an audiobook producer and narrator from Melbourne, Australia, co-directing the Australian audiobook production company Voices of Today, along with Dennis Daly. So what's this podcast all about? Well, I'm envisaging it as a meeting place, a space for conversation for groups of people who might not ordinarily meet together, but who are united by their interest in audiobooks. Whether you're an avid audiobook listener, an audiobook narrator or voice actor or producer, or whether you're an author keen to explore audiobooks as an avenue for your own writing, my hope is that you'll gain valuable insights into the world of audiobooks right here and that our conversations will spark creative new trajectories and collaborations because that's what conversation does. So let's get into it. In today's episode, We're talking audiobook research with one of the world's leading audiobook researchers, Professor Matthew Rubery. Matthew Rubery is a professor of modern literature at Queen Mary University of London. He is the author of The Untold Story of the Talking Book, published 2016, and editor of Audiobooks, Literature and Sound Studies, published 2011. His latest publication is Further Reading a collection of essays on the status of reading in the 21st century. Matt is zooming in today from London, talking to me in Melbourne. We have Professor Matthew Rubery with us today, uh, and it's a great pleasure to have you, Matt, on board for a discussion about audiobooks, which have been a, a topic of your research. But in terms of introduction, tell us a bit about yourself, what you do and... Um, and why you find yourself here talking about audiobooks. Yeah, uh, thanks for having me on. It's, um, so I teach in the English department at Queen Mary Uni- University of London uh, and start, started off as a book historian, but have gradually over the years become an audiobook historian. Um, and I spend a lot of time looking at new media formats, something like the audiobook, and then trying to trace its history, look at people's encounters with books like that, and how. Um, reading practices have changed over time. Were you a bookworm growing up? Uh, uh, yeah, I was a bookworm <laughs> before I became an audiobook worm. And, and in fact, I, I still think I'm, I'm I'm both. I read print compulsively. I listen to books compulsively. Excellent. Um, books are just a big part of my life in any format. So you've you've actually spent time researching audiobooks and writing about um, the form of audiobooks. What questions have driven your research? Why was this an area of interest to you? And what have you discovered as you've explored? I'd say the main question driving my research is what's the difference between reading a book with your eyes and listening to a book with your ears? Um, you know, I, I, as, as we know, audiobooks are a pretty ancient form of entertainment when you start looking at their history. So you can think back to, let's say, the Greeks and Homer reciting uh, his tales like the Odyssey or the Iliad to, to big audiences. Mm. Um, so in some ways, there's continuities between the way text used to be consumed by audiences uh, you know, millennia ago and then listening to an audiobook today. There's crucial differences as well. Um, but you would think with a form of entertainment that's been around that long, we'd have a better grasp of the differences between reading with your eyes and reading with your ears. But there's surprisingly little knowledge about uh, this topic. So I started delving into those issues. And in fact, the approach I ended up taking was basically um, looking at how, rather than thinking of audiobooks and print books as separate media, the audiobook throughout its long history has almost always evolved in relation to the print book. So there's been, uh, this is really clear when you look at the early history of the audiobook. Um, A lot of the early 20th century versions um, tend to be, let's say, record albums that show a picture of the printed book to make sure you know that in listening to the recording, mm. you were getting the same experiences as readers of print would get. Or we can think about the ways that narrators were reading a lot of these books as well, that instead of uh, taking a theatrical 
approach to books to make them as entertaining as possible, as many audiobooks do today, um, these readers would often just read uh, books in a monotone to try to you know, just make sure the emphasis was on the words themselves. They'd read everything. I mean, they'd read the title page, the notes, they'd read footnotes, they'd read the index. So all kind of the boring bits that could get chopped out of audiobooks today. Um, those were still a part of the experience. And even one of the old uh, talking book or audiobook players that I found from the 20th century, it's in the shape of an actual book. It looks like a, a big dictionary that would sit on your desk. Except when you open it up, instead of finding printed pages, uh, there's a little record player inside. So throughout much of their history, I mean, they were basically imitating books. And it's only recently that I think audiobooks have moved away from that format. Um, so I think in sort of trying to take on that big question about the differences between the two media, um, I ended up sort of focusing on a set of aesthetic questions about um, what made the experience of listening to a book kind of um, rich. So the questions I started pursuing were, what's, what exactly is the relationship between spoken and printed texts? Mm. How does the experience of listening to books compare to that of reading them? What influence does a book's narrator have over its reception? What methods of close listening are appropriate to such narratives? And finally, the big question, what new formal possibilities are opened up by uh, sound technology? So what can audiobooks do that printed books can't? Mm. And that's what I think publishers are doing today that makes audiobooks really exciting. Whereas for a lot of the 20th century, the emphasis was just on reproducing the printed book as faithfully as possible. Yeah, wow. So which is interesting because obviously oral tradition uh, came first, didn't it? Um, and yet there's this sense that that the written text is the official text. Um, and there's even in, in some of your work that I've read addressing that sort of argument about, well, is listening to an audiobook just as valid as reading or just as valid a form of reading as reading the text? Tell us a bit about that debate and what your take on that is. So I think the title of your podcast is a great sign of how far we've come in our attitudes towards audiobooks, that uh, it doesn't even seem controversial anymore that uh, listening to an audiobook is a form of reading. But that was certainly not my experience when I started this project. So again, this was, uh, I, I think, in the, must have been around 2012, mm. uh, 2011, I, I was working on audiobooks. And then the sort of uh, shaming of audiobook listeners it was pretty intense that uh, you would sort of get raised eyebrows if you mentioned that you listened to a book rather than read it in print. And a lot of people were very sheepish about admitting that. I, you know, I, even when I was doing this research, I remember sort of explaining to colleagues what I was working on and getting such puzzled looks from them as if it was kind of an illegitimate subject. But in the short time, that I was doing research for, for, for my book on the history of audiobooks, I did watch those attitudes change. So by the end, uh, I, I think my, my timing w w was pretty lucky in that suddenly everyone was interested in this form of audiobook uh, reading that was, was becoming popular and everyone seemed to be listening to books on their phones now. So it was a, a short period of time where those attitudes just shifted. And I've got great hope for the future because I think young people in particular are very open-minded about listening to books. Um, there's almost a generational divide between this, this perception of audiobooks being illegitimate in some ways. Uh, you, you know, personally, my perspective, I'm just delighted when people come into contact with books in any form. Yep. So I don't know why people yep. would get stressed about whether they're reading it in a certain way or not. Absolutely. I think, you know, I'll take stories any way they come. You know, I can't read a book while I'm driving anyway. I may as well be listening to one or, or you know, while I'm cleaning the house. So um, I'm with you on I that think, one, I think. And that's my attitude too, is that you know, listening to books originally for me was a time of, uh, was a way of extending my reading time. Mm. Uh, when I couldn't read in other ways, audiobooks sort of uh, filled that gap. I mean, my reading has kind of evolved now that I do sometimes listen to audiobooks by choice rather than uh, as, a, as a way to, to, to claw back time. Mm. But, it, you know, I think it's readers who are often the ones who turn to audiobooks rather than there being a split between the two. And those, I think there were five uh, questions that you used to sort of frame your research into audiobooks. Those all sounded like really interesting launching off points for conversations in themselves. But I think one of the questions was about how the narrator's voice or the narrator impacts uh, the way that an audiobook is received. So, you know, for me, what kind of makes a good audiobook is that fit between the narrator and the narrative. 
And this might seem obvious to us now, but it, it's a fairly recent development in the audio publishing industry. Uh, so a lot of my research into early audiobooks just I came across so many mismatches between the narrator who read the book aloud and what was being read. So often, let's say in the 40s and 50s, when uh, books were being made for blind readers in particular, it was just kind of the this, this gradual emergence of the commercial audiobook industry. There was a very small pool of narrators. So in Britain, for instance, it tended to be um, people who worked for the BBC. Uh, so uh, coming from a broadcasting tradition. And a lot of the readers were middle-aged men with upper-class accents. Um, you know, great readers uh, for, for, for some media, but not for all books. So I remember hearing, you know, an old man with an upper-class accent reading Charlotte Bronte's Jane Eyre, a, a novel about a, 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 an impoverished orphan um, growing up, learning about her identity as a woman in Victorian Britain. So just a total mis between hearing uh, an old guy read that book aloud compared to say something like a modern recording made by Juliet Stevenson, who's an exquisite reader of um, Victorian novels in particular. It has a real feel for Jane's voice and really brings mm -hmm. out the, uh, the pathos in, in, in that narrative. So I think we've made huge ground in that uh, respect because audio publishers are very aware of casting decisions now. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's, it's very rare now to have just some man randomly chosen to do a bad impression of women, children, um, immigrants, you, you yeah. know, there's uh, much yeah. more attention paid to identity. And I think that's, that's a great thing now. Yeah. And I mean, it's developed to the point that, you know, I like to push the boundaries. Like I'm a young Australian woman and I'm narrating 19th century German philosophy, like Hegel. Um, and I think, well, why isn't it my sort of text to narrate as much as it's anyone else's text to narrate, you know? Um, so. I, I, I do love that attitude. Uh, yeah. I, I think the difference is really, we would at least have that conversation or, or think to ourselves, uh, who would be the best narrator in the situation rather than just go to the default uh, yeah. uh, uh, you know, BBC official. Yeah. Um, but certainly that, that is one way in which my reading habits have changed over the years too, is that uh, when I started researching audiobooks, I was pretty open-minded about just listening to anything. I would listen to lots of free audiobooks recorded just by mm. know, enthusiastic fans of a novel. Um, having been exposed to such talented narrators, though, I do kind of see what a difference a good narrator can make. So I do tend to you know, pay a premium for my narrative for my audiobooks now because I do want to hear a really skilled narrator read it. Um, and I think it's a, a, a lot of people who uh, work on audiobooks notice that a lot of readers out there choose their books based on the narrator rather than based on the book. Yep. So once you sort of get the narrator that just clicks with you, you know, for me, it might be just going on and listening to everything Julia Stevenson uh, has read. Yep. Uh, you tend to follow them for their voice as much as for the text itself. Yeah, that's absolutely my experience too, you know, where I've come across narrators um, narrating freely, like on LibriVox, for example, and I think, oh my goodness, this person is amazing. I have to listen to all the titles that they've narrated. Um, but but there's a value too, isn't there, in um, being exposed to a whole lot of different diverse voices, like on LibriVox, for example, when you've got a group reading of, you know, George Eliot or something, and you've got, you know, English accents, but you've also got really Oka, Aussie accents and Indian accents. And, you know, it's a real mix um, and an interesting sort of global take on literature and on stories. Yeah, one of the things people who listen to literature notice is that the experience is not exactly the same as reading it and that you tend to sort of notice different aspects of the narrative. So, you know, I often uh, listen to books that I've read in print before. And I do, things stand out that I had just had not paid attention to in the print version. Um, so I think that's something fun about different narrators as well is, you know, depending on the voice, you'll probably notice different aspects of the text. Um, and my ideal is sort of having multiple narrators to choose from, let's say the LibriVox model, where there might be you know, four or five recordings of uh, Jane Eyre, mm -hmm. rather than just one to choose from. And you can kind of make that choice. You know, do I want a, a group recording? Do I want a, a young, teenage woman recording, mm. do I want a middle aged man recording? You've got some choice there and you can sort of make aesthetic decisions about, well, what works best? What do I think works best? And that's kind of where I'd like us to end up uh, with people being able to choose from a variety of competing narrative styles um, 
and have those type of debates about what makes a good reading yep. rather than does this count as a form of reading at all? Yeah, and uh, well, narrators are going to be happy to hear that sort of attitude because, you know, it doesn't matter if you record Anne of Green Gables again when there's already, you know, 27 versions up because <laughs> someone might like the sound of your voice and want to hear you read it to them. And we do see that with, with publishers, you know, the, the classics, it's usually a crowded audiobook market because there's going to be, like you say, dozens of recordings already already made of these texts. So they tend to bring in celebrities, right, to sort of yep. draw attention to a text that is widely available for free in most cases already, but they want to draw new attention to it. So yep. it, it's a good thing in many ways because it does say make, um, I don't know, Mark Twain texts briefly, it puts it briefly back in the public eye for a short period of time yep. before then just another one of the uh, two dozen recordings made of that text. <laughs> totally. So um, you've written about audiobooks and there's an audiobook version of your book about audiobooks, which is very fitting. Um, the Untold Story of the Talking Book. What's that book about and what did you learn while writing it? Yeah, I should mention this as a brief aside that it was not easy to get the publisher to make an audiobook recording. I had to really fight really? for that. Um, this was a university press and it's just okay. not part of the publishing model. Hmm. Uh, and I kept pointing out, you know, first question I'm always going to be asked is, is there an audiobook version of your book? Um, so eventually they, they recognized that too and were very helpful. But it's uh, as popular as audiobooks have become lately, I, I think university presses, small presses who are under kind of financial pressures have been slower to take up that trend. Uh, so hmm. I would love to see more you know, nonfiction books of that sort turned into audio. Um, my book, The Untold Story of the Talking Book, uh, it tells the story of the audiobook's evolution over more than a century. So we sometimes think of it as you know, a relatively new medium, mm. but my take is that the audiobook is as old as sound recording technology itself. So I take us all the way back to Thomas Edison's invention of the phonograph in 1877. Because of course the first recording he made on it to sort of test out his prototype machine was uh, a nursery rhyme. So basically a little bit of literary verse uh, when he read Mary had a little lamb aloud on the machine. Um, to me, that is the start of the audiobook right there. Um, in some ways it's tricky telling the story, the history of audiobooks, because it kind of depends on what you count as an audiobook. If you mean sort of full length, uh books on tape cassettes you could go back to the 1970s if you mean kind of excerpts from books recorded on records go back to the 50s if you talk about sort of short three or four minute performances you could take it all the way back to the early 20th century and of course if we're just talking about any form of literature um preserved in some way on wax cylinders or discs it does go back all the way to edison um, and i would say you know, as we know now, what starts off with Edison's just sort of experiment to record a nursery rhyme um, eventually evolves in today's multi-million dollar audiobook industry that many of us know and love. Mm -hmm. We've sort of talked about what, what makes a great audiobook listening experience for you. You talked about the fit between narrator and the narrative. Do you want to expand on that in terms of the listening experience? Sure. Yeah, so another thing my book does then is I kind of take us back into the, the various phases of the audiobook development, because I think the understanding of what a book can do changes dramatically over that time. And this sort of gets at the issue of uh, the reader's relationship to the narrator. So one of the biggest surprises I found in um, doing audiobook research is that uh, the sort of skepticism towards audiobooks as, as not being uh, real reading, as we talked about a moment ago, is very much a modern attitude. Uh, when I go back to the 19th century and look at people's responses to the first books that were made, they're almost entirely enthusiastic. Um, they, uh, pe people who read books can't wait to be able to listen to them instead. Um, and there's this idea that you know, reading is tough work. I mean, even just holding a book, you had to cut the pages at this time and turn them. It was just seen as a form of manual labor in many ways. So people <laughs> thought, oh, well, if you could make that even you know, easier to do, why wouldn't we want to do that? Um, and so I think Edison gets it exactly right in that he does predict that these early sound recording devices would be used to record books. Uh, he gets it totally wrong in that he thinks you'll be able to record a Dickens novel in his own time. That's, that's 
not true at all because you could only record a couple of minutes on a disc or a cylinder at the time. So it would have just been hundreds of distant cylinders that you keep having to change. It'd be mm -hmm. way too fiddly to, for, to be a realistic way of, of reading a book. But he's absolutely right in predicting the future direction of the book. So I co I've come across lots of 19th century uh, accounts of how great it would be to listen to books. And these readers often imagine a, a kind of seductive voice whispering the text into their ear. Um, Edison himself says really talented voice actors could read these texts in a way that's more entertaining than you know, the amateur reader could do uh, by sort of imagining these voices in their own mind. And that's a really interesting question for me because uh, books are kind of unique in that we sort of want to do all the work ourselves. You know, we don't read film scripts, we watch them performed, or we don't read um, sheet music, we hear people perform it. But with mm -hmm. books, we don't do that. We do all the work in our imaginations. I, I think this has a, has a good point that there are some very talented readers out there who can read the book better than uh, most of us can. So why wouldn't we want that form of uh, entertainment? Mm -hmm. um, the next phase I take us up to is the first books made for um, blind people beginning in the 1930s. And this was largely a development for soldiers who came back from the First World War. Many of them had lost their sight, and had no way of reading on their own. So there was a real push to get this technology up. Uh, but it's reading through a lot of their accounts of talking books that I sort of first glimpsed the passionate relationship people have for individual voices. Um, a lot of the narrators from this time are already just getting deluged with, with fan mail um, <laughs> about how much these uh, readers love hearing their voices and how they've really transformed their experience of hearing, let's say, the Bible or a, a 20th century novel. So there, it's quite moving to, um, to, to come across those accounts. And it kind of helped me thinking about the relationship between the reader and the narrator uh, in a different way, uh, about how, what a big part of people's lives it can be. Um, especially people with disabilities. And in fact, I've come across um, accounts written by people who would meet for the first time a narrator that they've been listening to uh, them read books for you know a good chunk of their life. And, uh, and, and the reader would burst into tears because wow. this, was, you know, this was a celebrity experience for them. Um, and then as we move forward into time, let's say with the start of the commercial audiobook industry in the 50s, you start to get more of the celebrity narrator phenomenon where instead of kind of just having a, uh, a person you've never heard of read a book to you, you do get that emphasis more on recognizable voices from other media, let's say uh, film actors um, and, and things like that. Going on into the late 20th century with the rise of audiobooks on tape cassettes, I think we get that shift towards unabridged audiobooks that just really isn't techn technologically possible for this time, uh, before this time. And that changes the relationship too, because instead of, you know, if you're stuck in traffic, you don't want an abridged book that's gonna end in an hour. You want that book to go on as long as possible. You've got a lot of time to fill. So again, you spend a lot of time with these narrators and it's almost a, a parasocial relationship where you almost view these narrators as a, a part of your social circle, someone you know intimately well. And that kind of brings us up to the present where we've got, a wider selection there than ever, as we were talking about, but also some controversies now about will AI replace uh, human narrators in the future? Yeah. We will all be listening to robots read our books in the future. In, in many ways, that's a good thing, not necessarily if you are a narrator yourself and think about it from a labor perspective, but it would be exciting to have the choice of hearing uh, Orson Welles or another um, long dead actor read a book that you've always wanted to hear read by them. Yeah, that's a fascinating point. Um, circling back to Edison, I love that comment that he makes about when he first records Mary Had a Little Lamb and he says that the purpose of the phonograph is the gathering up and retaining of sounds hitherto fugitive. That's a, that's a great way of putting it. Yeah, for an inventor, he had a real way with words. Didn't yeah, he? yeah. And do you, you, you mentioned Juliet Stevenson, do you have titles that you particularly love to listen to? Sure. Uh, so I kind of have different categories I think of when I, when I, when I, when I think about my favorite books. Um, so just the historian in me wants to give a shout out to Dylan Thomas's A Child's Christmas in Wales. So you know, one of the books that's often turned to as the book that launched the audiobook industry. So way back in 1952, um, the founders of Cadman Records, two women who'd recently graduated from university, um, persuaded Thomas to record some of his poetry for them uh, back when this wasn't really 
done. Um, he recorded some poems, it only, they only filled up one side of the record. So they said, oh, can you read anything else to fill up the, the other side of the record? And he read this short story, which has since become you know, a beloved classic that people still today uh, here in Britain uh, listen to on, on Christmas. When I speak to people about audiobooks, they often bring up this uh, title, uh, A Child's Christmas in Wales, and get, get a bit misty-eyed as they think about having listened to this over the years. So it's just one of those sort of great recordings from history, but one that still endures in its um, popularity and appeal today. I also like kind of that perfect match, I think, between a narrator and a book, um, someone whose voice fits just right. And I'm thinking of a text like uh, Lolita, read by the British actor Jeremy Irons. And he, you know, the narrator in that book is kind of this world-weary, decadent European, and Jeremy Irons just kind of nails that uh, tone just right in reading this sordid tale. Um, so yeah, that sort of brings out a shiver of pleasure for me when I hear his voice read that book. Mm. Um, Julia Stevens is another one I should put in that category that sort of takes texts I, I, I've read dozens of times and thought I knew very well and then helps me just um, see it in a completely different way. But I also like when narrators kind of transform a book. I mean, a book that I might not like that much in print. Um, and I'm thinking of Neil Gaiman's The Nancy Boys, uh, read by the actor Lenny Henry. And he just does the voices in such a funny way, which is a risk in audiobook narration. Um, there's sort of a group of Jamaican matriarchs in that book. Um, his book just, uh, his reading of that book just makes me laugh out loud. And it's a text that probably I wouldn't have been excited by in print, um, that he somehow just brings to life for me in a way it's hard to describe. Hmm. I also kind of like books that have narrators um, who present challenges in different ways. And I'm thinking of a book like Jonathan Latham's Motherless Brooklyn, where the narrator has Tourette's. So it has sort of verbal tics that make it a real challenge for a narrator to read aloud. Um, the audiobook version of that read by Frank Moeller, though, really uh, does that in an exciting way by incorporating it into the narration and capturing mm -hmm. these tics that uh, set it apart from, uh, from a silent reading where those tics are kind of less pronounced in my, at least in my silent reading in my head. Um, and then the final category I have in mind is kind of, uh, you know, one of the genres that works best for audiobooks is, uh, is, is personal memoirs, where you want to hear the, uh, the, the author or the celebrity in many cases read that book aloud because you're kind of imagining their voice in your head anyway. So you might as well have the real thing. So I think these memoirs work really great. Um, examples that would come to mind would be something like Trevor Noah's Born a Crime about his childhood in South Africa. So not only does his sort of accent make a big difference there because he, he talks a lot about regional dialects uh, in, in his home country. Um, so to hear him sort of do those accents that I didn't know how they sounded. That's a big help. Mm. But also it's, it's, it's very, you know, he's a comedian. It's a funny book. So it's much funnier, I think, hearing it uh, read aloud than, um, than reading it for yourself. And one last plug I'll make uh, in the comedy uh, line is Alan Partridge's We Need to Talk About Alan. Mm. So this is by a British comic personality. Um, it's kind of an invented persona, Alan Partridge. So even though it's read by the actor Steve Coogan, he's reading it in character as Alan Partridge. So again, sort of takes advantage of the affordances of audiobooks to do something that print can't do. You know, in this case, to hear the sort of funny voice um, perform the book rather than just trying to imagine uh, Alan's delivery if you were reading it to yourself. That's brilliant. Well, Matt, you have spent um, a lot of time not only listening to audiobooks, but thinking about them and writing about them and researching them. And uh, you've given us a lot to think about. So we very much appreciate your time and your contribution to today's episode. Great. Thank you very much. It's always nice talking to fellow audiobook listeners, readers. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. It was great to hear Matt's perspective on audiobooks as an academic researcher and just generally as an avid fan of audiobooks. If you're looking for your latest audiobook listen, here are a few suggestions which you can find on Audible and many other audiobook sales platforms. Not Just a Piece of Cake, Being an Author is an anecdotal memoir by acclaimed Australian children's author Hazel Edwards, famous for her book series about the hippopotamus on the roof eating cake. Aspiring creatives will find inspiration for making a long-term creative vocation work. 
as Hazel takes readers along for her adventures. Narrated by Erin Marie White. If you're looking for something for the kids, check out Elephants Have Wings by Suzanne Gervais, another well-known Australian author. Designed for children ages three and above, this soundscape explores the perpetual human challenge of finding unity amidst diversity. To do this for kids, Suzanne draws on the metaphor of the elephant, which is used in a variety of cultures and religions around the world. If you're a fan of multicast productions, why not take a look at Rilla of Ingleside by L. M. Montgomery, author of Anne of Green Gables. This is the last book in the Anne of Green Gables series and follows the adventures of her youngest daughter Rilla, particularly as she has to come to grips with the realities of World War I. You can find Rilla on Kobo.com. To keep up with all the latest Voices of Today productions, you can find us on Instagram at Voices of Today VOT or follow us on Facebook. This has been the Audiobook Readers Review, produced by Voices of Today and hosted by Sarah Backhaller. Tune in next time for another great interview. If you want to get in contact with us, you can visit voicesoftoday.org forward slash contact. Thanks for listening. <laughs>